um, that eventually um, only his heart and his lungs would still be operating, and his brain. And that they told him that eventually he would essentially have the body of a cabbage, but his mind would still be in perfect working order, and he would be unable to communicate with the rest of the world. My dreams at that time were rather disturbed. Before my condition had been diagnosed, I had been very bored with life. There had not seemed to be anything worth doing. But shortly after I came out of hospital, I dreamt that I was going to be executed. I suddenly realized that there were a lot of worthwhile things I could do if I were retrieved. I knew perfectly well that he had no faith. Um, and to me that made it the more difficult because you must ask yourself, why me? Why this? Why now? Um, but he just totally, flatly accepted that this was what was going to happen to him. And as far as I can gather, at that point, he started to do some work. At first, there did not seem much point in working at my research, because I didn't expect to live long enough to finish my PhD. However, as time went by, the disease seemed to slow down. I began to understand general relativity and make progress with my work. But what really made a difference was, I got engaged to a girl called Jane Wilde. This gave me something to live for, but it also meant that I had to get a job if we were to get married. Stephen was already ill, Jane knew it, and it was another instance of Stephen's luck, you know, meeting the right person at the right time, because Jane, Stephen was very, very badly depressed, and uh, he wasn't really very much inclined to go on with his work. I mean, he'd been told he'd only got two and a half years, what can you do in that time? But meeting Jane really put him on his mettle, and he started to work. I wanted to understand how the universe began. Einstein's theory of general relativity showed that the universe was expanding. But there was no answer to the crucial question, must there have been a Big Bang, a beginning to time? Then, in my third year at Cambridge, Roger Penrose made his discovery about the death of stars. I remember talking to this friend, Ivor Robinson, and uh, we were having a sort of very animated conversation, and then we had to cross a road, and, and as we crossed the road, of course, the conversation stopped, <laughs> and then we got to the other side. Well, evidently, I had some idea when crossing the road, but then the conversation started up, and I, it got completely blotted out of my mind. And it was only later, after, after my friend had gone home, uh, and uh, I began to have this strange feeling of elation, feeling wonderful. <laughs> And I couldn't figure out why on earth I should feel like that. So I went back over the day thinking all possible things which might have contributed to such a feeling. And then gradually I unearthed this thought which I'd had while crossing the street. Penrose announced this result that when stars collapse indefinitely, uh, they will become singular as long as some very uh, broad conditions are satisfied that everybody would have regarded as reasonable. And I remember Stephen Hawking, who was then approaching his third year as a research student, saying, what very interesting results. I wonder whether they could be adapted to understanding the origin of the universe. And what he had in mind, you see, was that if just mentally you reverse the sense of time, you can think of the expanding universe as a collapsing system. It's a bit like a giant, very giant star collapsing. Roger Penrose proved that a dying star collapsing under its own gravity, eventually shrinks to a singularity, a point of infinite density and zero size. I realized 
that if I reversed the direction of time, so that the collapse became an expansion, I could prove that the universe had a beginning. But, my proof, based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, also showed that we cannot understand how the universe began. Because it showed that all scientific theories, including general relativity itself, break down at the beginning of the universe. We had this meeting at the Institute of Space Physics in New York. I said before we reach a final conclusion, we ought to throw into the pot still another object, a gravitationally completely collapsed object. Well, after you've used the phrase, a gravitationally completely collapsed object, ten times, you conclude you've got to get a better name. So that's when I switched to the word black hole. The word black hole, which John Wheeler coined, suddenly caught on. Everybody uh, adopted it. And from then on, uh, people around the world in, in, in Moscow, uh, in, uh, in um, America, in England and elsewhere, uh, could uh, uh, know they were speaking about the same thing. And uh, uh, not only that, but it suddenly the whole range of concepts got through to the general public. And even the science fiction writers uh, all of a sudden could uh, talk, talk about it. Tonight, my friends, we stand on the brink of a feat unparalleled in space exploration. If the data on my returning probe ship matches my computerized calculations, I will travel where no man has dared to go. Into the black hole? In, through, and beyond. Why, that's crazy. <laughs> Impossible. As a massive star contracts, its gravity becomes so strong that light can no longer escape. The region from which nothing can escape is called a black hole, and its boundary is called the event horizon.